It's amazing. I think we have 130 people here logged in. So thank you so much for taking time um, out of your Thursday evening to join us. My name is Josephine Wollington, and I'm a volunteer and a member with the Portland chapter of the Native Plant Society of Oregon in protection of Oregon's native plants. And I would like to especially welcome any new members here tonight. Uh, as part of our mission, we present a speaker each month on timely topics of interest to members. And tonight's speaker is Dr. David Lewis, who will be presenting um, his uh, work uh, with his new book, which I have a copy of right here. And it's a beautiful cover. And um, he'll be telling us about um, traditional Kalapuya landscapes in the Willamette Valley. And we'll get to his presentation shortly. And just as a uh, kind of reminder, some Zoom etiquette, uh, your audio and your video should be turned off during the program. Uh, but after the presentation, there'll be an uh, opportunity to unmute yourself and turn your cameras on. And this would be a great time for any new members to introduce themselves and connect with each other virtually. And if you do have a question during the program, I'll be facilitating the Q&A at the end. So feel free to type in your question in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And um, Dr. Lewis will then um, answer questions after his presentation. Dr. Lewis is a member of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron and author of the recently released Tribal Histories of the Willamette Valley. He is an assistant professor of anthropology and indigenous studies at Oregon State University. Dr. Lewis has done extensive research on tribal histories. As a specialist in the history of Kalapuyans and other Western Oregon tribes, he has studied the momentous changes to the Willamette Valley with the arrival of European settlers. He has tracked the changes and will share in particular how the loss of water and fire in the environment has created challenges to the tribes and others as they work to restore these landscapes today. And I just want to extend a personal um, bit of gratitude to Dr. Lewis, who has helped me immensely in my work as a journalist and um, given me lots of interviews and takes lots of time to share all his knowledge and so much of what I know about the Willamette Valley is because of Dr. Lewis. So thank you. Um, if you have comments, again, put them in the chat. Um, even, you know, you can actually, if you think of questions throughout the presentation, you can put them in chat anytime. So you don't lose track of your comments. That's pretty, that's a pretty good way to go. Um, so uh, this presentation is really kind of like the next phase of, of what of my presentations. I've been working for about 25 years on tribal histories of the Lot Valley in Western Oregon. And for a long time, for some 20 years, I've been working uh, mainly just to tell the story of the, the tribes. And that uh, has seemed like an ever repeating, uh, you know, merry-go-round loop for me because I constantly have told the same stories over and over again with some additions and now I'm moving on to the next phase of, of looking at the environments looking at clues in the environments that that uh, that help us understand more about the tribes and their culture and, and how the tribes affected cultures and how the cultures uh, I mean how, uh, how affected environments and how the environments actually affected tribes as well and so we are now some 180 years past uh, the tribes being in control of the valley uh, being the primary people of the valley and and so we've seen a lot of changes since then. And I guess my uh, presentation here is really about um, understanding, you know, those changes that have been made or ha has have happened in the last 180 years, and uh, s seeing signs of these changes in uh, in our environment. And so mm -hmm. let me let me just continue with this this uh, presentation here. Um, First off, introduction of the tribes. So we have um, the Kalapuya and Wallala tribes, who are their primary tribes in the Willamette Valley. And they, uh, uh, as you can see, there were quite a number of them. There wasn't just one Kalapuya tribe. There are many, many Kalapuya tribes. Each one kind of organized behind a, a really distinguished, kind of spiritually powerful leader. Uh, and some of the biggest tribes um, were actually up by Portland. Uh, the Tualatin was actually a very powerful tribe that had lots of resources. And the San Yam in the Mid Valley was actually a very powerful tribe too. They had lots of allies and resources. I'm not going to read all the names here. You can see them on your screen. Um, but originally there's a population of about, you know, it's estimated around 16,000 
people before diseases and other things took uh, uh, effect on the tribes. Uh, and they occupied all the way down into the Umpqua Valley. So we had Calpines in the Umpqua Valley as well, the, the young Kalas. So a lot of people. And then the Malalas are mainly on the, the eastern side of the valley. They occupied the foothills and somewhat the mountains. And so those people were also in the valley too. So the valley had at least two tribes, if if not also the Clackamas, who were up in the north side, the north part of the valley as well. So, but uh, primarily Calipuans and Malalas were in the valley. Um, uh, one uh, tool I've been using for years in all kinds of research is the Calipuia calendar. You may have seen this before in my presentations, but it's basically a calendar co uh, collected by Albert Gatchett in 1877 from the Grand Running Reservation from the Tualatin people. He uh, they they narrate a 12 month calendar to him, and and you can as you see, the names are quite complex. Uh, I I can't even say them; they're so complex because nobody actually right now speaks the Calpia language. But the translations of each one each name is is it follows the the name itself, and uh, the first month actually begins kind of in the spring, and they continue through the summer, and then the the last month uh, you know ends in August or, or whatever. So they so there's a very long sort of drawn out period uh, uh, where the they divide the summer into more uh, parcels because of the the way the plants were being harvested and and, and prepared, and so uh, much of the calendar is really kind of based on a plant calendar, uh, a plant harvest calendar, um, with wapato and camas being the primary crops um, on their calendar. They don't mention fishing on the calendar and only mention hunting once. So that means for me, as a researcher looking back at the tribe, it's possible that they spent mo most of their time uh, worrying about where the, the when the plants are being were ready to be harvested, and and so they they spent less time worrying about uh, hunting, less time worrying about fishing, primarily because they didn't have a lot of good fishing holes in the valley, so it was harder to fish unless you you know had traps or whatever, and you really didn't need to ha have a lot of fishing in the valley because. You could take your your excess uh, harvest up to the Clackamas people and trade for the salmon they had there, and they would always have lots of salmon. Uh, as well, the Wapato was a highly desired uh, resource in the valley, and so uh, you know it's just they they spent a lot of time on these plants, and I and I can't I can't imagine that they were not. This is almost like a, a you know a farmer's calendar really of the valley, even though they never did farm. So uh, this really gives us a lot of clues as to what was important to the tribes back in the day. And so from this calendar and other things I put together, uh, what's called a seasonal round, kind of a model of what their seasons may have looked like. You know, they have a winter village and they talk about the winters being very, uh, very harsh, very cold. And back then they were very cold, because much colder than today, uh, because, I mean, uh, rivers like the like the uh, Columbia would freeze over, solid. So um, nowadays it rarely does. In fact, it hasn't. I think frozen since the nineteen sixties at one point. So we're, we are uh, in a much more warmer climate today than than they were in the hundred hundred eighty years ago. So in the winter time they have you know sturgeon they would would get. Uh, they would do hunting camps as well for food. Uh, sir, uh, smelt would come into the rivers and and come into the sandy and callets. They can get smelt either through trade or for getting the, the fish themselves. Uh, Camas root camp begins kind of really on the calendar. It actually began sometime in March because they would get it before it actually uh, um, uh, har uh, uh, went, went to bloom. And so that becomes what we call a starvation crop. People at the end of the winter are running out of supplies, storages that they've made through the wintertime. And so they are then accessing uh, these sort of below ground storage places, the, the you know, the canvas fields for food. And so that's what they're doing. Spring salmon comes along in, in May. Uh, they may take a lot of their, of their crops or need, need food. So they may be going to trade gatherings for salmon and other crops from other places. Um, Weaving materials camps happening also in the in the in the spring, 
And then the summertime, we see more canvas root camp, huckleberry camps, acorn camps. And then at the end of summer, we have a fall prairie fire. So they are moving around, uh, not staying in their main villages, but moving around to summer encampments, uh, staying for a couple weeks, two or three weeks in one location in, a, in like a camp out while they're harvesting and preparing their crops and taking them back eventually to the main villages. And then they have a fall salmon run. They can get salmon clearly from the Columbia if it's not on the, on the Willamette. More trade gatherings, more weaving materials, hazelnut camps. Wapto gathering begins in, in late uh, uh, September, October, November. So Wapto is a major crop for the, for the whole valley and the Columbia River at this point. And then more hunting camps and back to the river village. So that's kind of a, in a rough pattern what their annual uh, season would look like. Uh, with them traveling from place to place to where the food is ready and never uh, never did they really think about um, uh, agriculture because they didn't have it uh, they, they did not plant these materials that as far as we know there is a possibility in some newer theories that some of the tribes like the Malala may have been taking camas up into the Cascades and planting camas uh, at, at they say along the trade trails in the Cascades at some three, 4,000 feet. And that would uh, allow there to be a summer crop of camas up in the high Cascades when they needed it. And so that's a possibility. We haven't yet proven that, but we are looking at that. This theory is called the forest gardens theory. It comes down from British Columbia. Uh, but we are simply looking at that stuff right now. Um, so a lot of... Uh, a lot of my research is really kind of ethnographically based, anthropologically based. And so I was um, a couple of years ago looking through a lot of the Wilkes expeditionary notes from the 1840s, 1841, when they came through the Lamont Valley. And uh, the expedition, when it got to Oregon, um, split up. Um, some of them went uh, north uh, on the Columbia and, so, and half of the expedition went south through the Lamont Valley and all the way down to Sacramento. Um, as they are walking through the valley, they're making a lot of observations, and these are basically scientists and officers on on the ship, uh, U.S. Uh, in under this U.S. exploring expedition. And and some of the their observations are pretty interesting. And actually, they don't appear in the Wilkes, the published Wilkes journals. Um, and I don't know why. I, I think maybe Wilkes Charles Wilkes never really accessed these journals. Uh, we got them through scholars that were working on these issues on the, the Wilkes journals, and uh, I was able to read them in their own handwriting uh, from these copied, uh, uh, copied journals. And so we see his August 11th, 1841, all the prairie to the west of us has been burnt and uh, contrasted strongly with the green patches of woods and narrow belts bordering upon streams. Did not see a living soul nor any other signs of habitation than a small stream of smoke curling above a distant cluster of trees. And this is George Emmons, and he's probably he's somewhere in the Mid Valley, traveling down from where Salem is all the way down uh, through where Eugene is, and he's he's not at Eugene yet. Uh, he's probably just just south of Salem, and so what he's seeing this curling smoke are the Calipuyans already beginning to set fire to the Vallant Valley, set, set fire to the prairies. He's seeing them basically setting the fires about a day or two ahead of him um, and as he's traveling south. And so we see more of this. September 7th, 1841, a large part of the prairie is lately burnt over and blackened. So he's actually at the site, the expedition is at the site of where they saw the curling smoke above the trees. The whole burnt region, it was burnt burning prairies, and more distant part uh, of the probably prairie obscured by smoky, smoky, I guess, air arriving around the, uh, from the burning of the country. Uh, September 9th, there's a gr there's dirty, grassy, mostly burned over scattered oaks by prairie fires. And so they're admitting, because they've been talking to tribal people on the way, and probably uh, other sort of like fur traders, that uh, uh, what's happening is the native people are we're setting fires to the prairies, uh, you know, and this is what, what they're burnt, walking through, this burnt landscape on the prairie. I didn't write it in here, but 
Another interesting point uh, to make about this um, is every time they camped overnight, they would they would have to sort of set their, their horses out to graze and their horses would wander away, mainly because they had nothing to eat. There was no forage because it's all a burnt prairie. So it took them like half a day or more to find all their horses. And this is why it took them so long to get from one from the from the north part of the valley down to the southern part, because they're spending half a day or more looking for their horses every day. So pretty interesting uh, sequence of events. And then September 7th, um, uh, so, sorry, September 10th, about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, the pass what is called Lake La Mali, uh, area 80 foot in width and three quarters of a mile in length. Um, it's uh, continuing along the margin of this to the southward, struck Long Tom Buff or La Mali River, and eventually encamped. This is by Henry Eld. <laughs> so, this Lake La Mali was kind of at the end of the Long Tom River. It's probably at the estuary of the river because it enters into the Willamette or close to that. And what they're seeing is the results of a flood what they call a seasonal or summer freshette, a seasonal rain. And uh, they had just gone through a period a couple of days earlier where everything had been raining. It had been raining uh, in the valley. And so uh, now they are seeing what the results of that rain. Um, uh, it created a low, very, very uh, um, uh, big lake in the, in the prairie that sat there, would sit there for a couple of days and probably eventually drain off. And again, uh, also on September 10th, somebody else records, uh, J George Emmons reports, records a, a low prairie, perfectly barren, having been burnt like most of the country, could not determine the extent of, owing to the smoke, um, the view to space within two miles round, skirted the barge of a small lake of fresh water, the surface about a foot below the surface of the prairie, the banks very steep and miry, soon after it came upon the banks of a small river called Long Tom Buff, which is the Long Tom River. So that... There he goes. Two different people saw this the same lake at this the same day and uh, had to skirt around it. It was uh, miry enough they um, they they couldn't uh, withstand it. So this got me to thinking. Well, this is in the middle of summertime, so we never see these kind of lakes today in the summertime. So what what's going on with the, with the, the the environment? So let's move on. So. Um, I began thinking about what is the impact of settlement of settlers. And so they uh, looks like they were began turning all the prairies into agriculture. We know that from um, all of our stories about the settlers coming into the valley. They fence the land, they change water systems, they plowed up native plants and reduced much of the food for the tribes. So uh, trial bands were that were in the minority after nearly two decades of settlement. By the 1850s, they, they started beginning in the minority. Uh, and then cultural fires were being uh, suppressed. You know, uh, farmers didn't want these fires burning across their land because agriculture doesn't do as well with fire as sort of native plants. And land began uh, to go through changes without annual stewardship. So um, if we uh, assume the tribes that have set these fires every year for maybe thousands of years, I think we have records now that go back some 7,000 years of fire stewardship in the valley. Um, then that the whole valley had gone through what they call an anthropogenic change. It had mod it had like adapted to the annual use of intentional fire by native people. And so the plants, the animals, the, the very environment that they chose to create with the fires uh, was beneficial to them. It produced food and it, it, it actually absolutely modified for them. And so, this is why when you hear about like uh, what the environments of the prairies were in the valley uh, when settlers first got here as sort of these clear prairies, all cleared of trees and only trees down by the rivers. And so it was a very open, very sort of like uh, inviting space for farmers that these these fires created that whole this whole landscape. But taking that away um, and, and instead um, it, uh, putting uh, only settlers on the land. Settlers by the 1850s were the majority of the landowners in the valley. They had, they changed all the way that stewardship was happening, and so you're taking fire away. So what? Did, so the question is then, what does the the environment look like after that? 
how long does it begin to uh, adapt to the new changes that came came to them? Almost like a double change from taking away the native the native uh, uh, ways of, of management and adding on uh, settler probably what they call uh, um, uh, European American ways of, of managing the land instead. Uh, and these, like I said, these changes are not fully documented. We're just sort of trying to document this now, but um, but as time went forward, uh, farmers got more and more active in changing, in modifying the land to benefit themselves, their wealth, uh, to produce more crops, uh, to produce more, to have more land altogether. And we'll see some of that here. So uh, under settlers, um, uh, settlers thought, well, we saw these shorter summers. So the valley itself uh, does not have a long enough summers for many of the European crops or even crops from other places in the Americas that came to Oregon. And they get uh, more rain in the valley than, than perhaps they're used to in Europe or the east, the east coast of the United States or south, you know, uh, uh, southern areas of the United States where they have corn and things like that. And so uh, these regular rains, they create swales uh, as recorded in the Wilkes expedition. And so these swales are a problem for farmers. I mean, they they literally, when they develop next to a field, they will destroy crops. And this is actually recorded numerous times in newspapers and other, other uh, reports. These large lakes, some of the large lakes that expand, that uh, have a sort of a constant flow, uh, have these areas called beaver soils. And we see some of the lakes like, like Wapato Lake and Lake Labish and other lakes in, in the valley that had a constant flow, have these, be these beaver soils, these peat, heavy peat soils that were really, really super rich and nutritious and like black soils. Um, and the seasonal freshets tended to, to expand these lakes and destroy settler crops and shorten the growing season extent, uh, immensely. And settlers were very upset about this and wanted to seek a way to, to, uh, to dry up and create more what they call arid soils for their land so that they could have more crops and they could be more uh, get more wealth off that land. So um, so that's that's their purpose uh, in time. And so what they did is they imposed their own sort of worldview on it. They destroyed, they, they plowed up all the native lands. They began to drain off the soils as best they could find ways to get rid of all these uh, these excess lakes, these excess swales, and make the land drain constantly because there's way too much water in the valley for what they want to grow. Uh, so draining these late, these wetlands began to destroy native crops. The wapato especially is, is kind of a wetland crop and habitat for thousands of species like camas and other root crops, animal species, bird species, insects, you know, uh, fishes and other things. Also, Matt, there were mass at one point massive flocks of duck in the valley. These canvasback ducks would come in the valley in the in probably the millions, and they would occupy these lake systems, these swale systems, for uh, uh, quite a while. Uh, enough time in the valley that uh, they were it was actually very good hunting in some of the lakes. So they created um, so that the farmers created began creating a more arid landscape for farming. And they began lengthening by doing so by having a constant drain on the land. They began lengthening their growing season out because even if you get uh, like a, a late summer or fall uh, rainfall, like a, a, even a big rainfall, if you have drain systems in place, they're constantly draining it off. So your soil is is arid longer in the year. Uh, so terraforming ca causes uh, landscape erosion and channelized lakes and ditches. So this makes the water go out to the the Willamette River and then to the Columbia and then to the ocean much faster with uh, with uh, drained uh, landscapes than be before. This could absolutely change lots of different environments for fishes and other other animals and plants that we even thought about. Uh, so that's um, something to think about in the future. Uh, I'm thinking about how it affects salmon. We we think right now that salmon as a species only come came into the valley maybe in the spring because because the water at, at, at the Willamette Falls is uh, is uh, is high enough that the, the salmon can jump over the falls but what about what if the there was enough rainfall in the in the valley in the summertime to to raise the the the, the river level in the fall to have even a fall run of Chinook? if that's the case then 
by uh, allowing the water to to uh, to drain off the land faster may have destroyed uh, maybe a fall run of Chinook. And we're fine. I'm finding um, cases in in around Eugene where native people were coming to the area in the fall and they were processing salmon in the Eugene area in the fall. And I'm wondering where that salmon came from. Um, so this is uh, ongoing research I'm working on to figure out like maybe what I'm what I'm noticing here with the destruction of water systems, the changing of water systems is also changing of systems for fit for salmon as well. So let's get to some actual case studies. So Lake Labish in Marion County, uh, you've probably heard of it. You know, I grew up near it, uh, just outside of Salem. I used to go down uh, Cordon Road and and visit. Uh, on occasion to get, I had a job there at one point, weeding onions when I was a kid, uh, but it's actually never been a lake in my lifetime. And so I, I got busy a couple of years ago looking at like, why, why was it called a lake when there's never been any water there in my lifetime? And so I found some old maps. These are GLO maps, put them together, found this gigantic lake system that extends for probably 12, 14 or so miles from maybe from all the way from I-5 into the interior to the uh, uh, pretty far into the interior of of the of the county. And it's centered around uh, what's called Lake Labish today, pretty close to where um, Chamao Indian School is and to the east. Um, and, and but the lake system is not just the lake. It's all these wetland areas that are associated with it that those are the areas that would expand when there's um, summer rains um, or when there's lots of water coming down from mil from snow meltfall. So uh, that's uh, that was pretty interesting to me to see how big this lake system is um, or had been. Um, and then I saw also in our uh, in my research that there was actually lots of Kalapuya and Malala tribes around the lake. And they may have actually been uh, attracted to live in this area because of the lake, because the lake had a, a lot of resources around it. Lakes and water systems have lots of resources, lots of places to get food. And so there were hundreds of varieties of wildlife, fishes, birds, and native plants. There were cattail, wapato, camas, tule, willow, oak, hazel, crab apples, and cherries, and many other things around in this lake or around the lake. And the soils are very black, very nutritious. Uh, some say the richest soil content in, in the world. There's even still a layer of Mazama ash there. So you, so if you plow down, if you dig down about a foot and a half into the lake, you'll find this sort of layer of Mazama ash. And the peat soils go below that. So Mazama was, what, 7,000 years ago? So this is a very old lake system. Uh, it's been there a very long time. And it has not yet been destroyed because most agriculture is in the first, you know, half foot of uh, of, of the topsoil. Um, so these are what uh, canvas looks like in the middle here. And then we have Wapato on the side. Wapato is a very nutritious bulb. Canvas is also a very nutritious bulb. They're all food plants of the tribes. Uh, Wapato is, a, is what they call arrow leaf or arrow root uh, plant. And there's odd, lots of these varieties of Wapato around the world. Um, that uh, lots of people around the world use for food. So um, under my research, uh, I did a lot of historical research and I tried to figure out like what happened to it, you know, what, how did it, how was it drained off? So we found lots of recordings of people of the lake fluxing, of it being raining, people having, uh, having uh, crops next to the lake being destroyed. And so we saw, um, I saw uh, reports of this this man named Withicum, who had become governor in the early 20th century, who was who had a big farm out by Hillsboro, was very successful in his uh, uh, in his um, soil drying experiments, uh, and what they did is they devised the means of of using what they call a ditch witch, which we have today. There's a company that has that to dig a, a, trench, a trench all the way to the nearest river. And so what they did is they attracted people around Lake Labish. They attracted a family of land speculators from California, the Hayes family, uh, related to Brother B. Hayes, the president, to buy a thousand acres of land at Lake Labish. They used their own money, about $100,000, to dig a, a trench six miles long 
all the way from Lake Labish to the the Willamette River, and this becomes um, Labish Creek. It runs right through Kaiser, Oregon today. Um, and they did this because they labeled the lake a swamp, and because under Oregon law, swamps and marshes can be drained, but lakes cannot. So <clears throat> I was thinking about that, and I'm like, you know, it was actually it was it was a lake. So how could they get legally? be able to drain it um well it's because nobody really cared nobody really liked the lake it was described as being a mess of 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 swamp of swamps marshes and and plants and and animals and you couldn't be used it was called useless land and so so they just everybody turned the cheek that went the other way and uh and didn't look at what was happening and they just drained the lake off and the other farmers around them helped them because they're all going to get rich on this because once that lake is drained and you can expand your land into the lake soils, uh, you no longer have to worry about, uh, you know, the rains, uh, you know, like uh, uh, drowning your crops anymore. And and you you get and your land values are going, are going to go up. And that's what happened is they sold they bought the land. The Hayes family bought the land really cheap. And when once they drained off the lake, it took up to 1918 to do so. Uh, they're able to sell. They're able to uh, sell their, their land at a higher price, a much higher price, some of the highest valued agricultural lands in the valley today. Um, so that's and then they invested in other properties. They went up from there. One of the brothers went to uh, Wapato Lake and started another project up there, which we'll talk about in a second. And part of the family also, I believe, invested in a whole subdivision of Salem, um, we now call Hayesville, for obvious reasons. So today on on the on today's uh, Google Maps, we see the outline of part of the lake system here, and you can see the the lands are kind of like contorted because they had to fit into they were new allotments that were fit there fit into the land land, uh, and so it's still there. It's just that the whole thing's drained. It's whole things in agriculture. Uh, here's what it looks like. We have onions mostly growing there because onions grow in the most nutritious soils. Walla Wallas are, are pretty big there. Very, very, again, black soils. And um, <clears throat> about a year ago, um, a farmer uh, contacted me after I did my first story, on my first essay on the, on the history of Lake Labiche. And he said, hey, he's been conserved, work, working on a conservation project on his property for 20 years, and now he has Wapto growing back. So I went to check it out, and yep, there's Wapto there. All he had four different plots of wapato growing on the property, and he said he never planted it. And so we have uh, first by first dig only one shovel. I pulled out like ten of these wap wapato uh, bulbs, and these are very small. I don't think it's a, it's ideal uh, conditions. There's not enough water there still, uh, but he is sort of, of destroying drain the draining from his land and letting the water collect in the winter time. So it's better. It's better uh, environment for for Wapato to grow, and his uh, theory right now is that it's probable that the Wapato came in, maybe with geese, or maybe there were some bulbs that survived underground for nearly a hundred years uh, until they were allowed to grow again. Uh, he doesn't know, so we, we don't know how the how they got there. It's an interesting question. Um. Uh. Just to take this further. You know, we're we're working with the landowners today. Going out and visiting on a regular basis, uh, the land and help helping him. In fact, I brought some camas out there to plant some camas uh, this last year. Uh, but I've noticed that Shamal Indian School here and here's the school there today. A uh, big piece of property. Um, they have actually an arm of the lake. If you look at the southern and western side, you see the lake arm curls around, and it goes up around like this and over down that. There's I five right there. So I-5 stops it, but they have a big piece of the lake. And right now I'm working with Grand Run Tribe to sort of do what we can to begin working, uh, doing some inventory there and work on this lake system. Maybe we can bring Wapato back into this part of the lake system too and bring some sort of a TEK type, traditional ecological knowledge type programming to uh, Chimau Indian School. I think that would be a great thing for them. They they seem to think it's a good idea too. So. Anyway, so that's uh, pretty interesting. This is this section has never been developed, has never been plowed. 
So it's probably maybe the only surviving piece of the lake has not been somewhat destroyed. Um, so the original valley wetland was large flat prairies butted up to rivers and creeks, hosting varieties of grains and root plants. Uh, upland white, white oak savanna scattered in the prairie on raised hills and buttes. Low, low lakes, marshes that expand to expansive swales and low water from seasonal rains throughout the valley and regular annual flooding. At the time uh, of Calipuyan setting cultural fires, much of the valley was wetland. Thus, the fires and the wetlands may have worked together to protect the plants uh, underground. So that so when people talk about bringing fire back to the valley, it's going to be a good thing. But I think we also need to bring some water back to the valley, too. Because I believe that plants adapted to this environment where they had water and they the water would mitigate the effects of the fire quite a bit. Um, so the the wetland, which would have protected uh, animal plant species in the fire. The interactions effects of cultural fire regimes need to be considered within the context of seasonal wetlands to have a, a, an effect uh, which is restorative to land. Um, undoubtedly, the expansive... Um, Seasonal wetlands have significant effects on downstream health, fish health, animal, and human health. So these are important things to say. So Lake Wapato, similarly, uh, the next uh, project of the of the Hayes family, they went, they bought a bunch of land at uh, at, uh, at uh, Wapato Lake. This had been an amazing sort of natural resource for the Tualatin tribe. They really wanted it so much that they asked for it as part of, uh, of to be their reservation in 1851, which they never got, but they asked for that. Um, uh, <clears throat> Palmer, um, uh, Joel Palmer, the Indian agent at the time, noted that um, that Wapta was a significant pro, um, um, resource for the tribes. He said, he said, settlers have taken and now occupy within the reserve nearly all the lands susceptible of cultivation without regard to the occupancy of the Indians. When several incidents have been driven from their huts, their fences thrown down, property destroyed, and injuries inflicted on their persons. This is how valuable this farmland was. Um, the Wapato, Camas, and other nutritious crops around the principal residence, uh, constituting their chief means of substances, have since the, the increase of swine in the country gradually diminished in quality, uh, quantity, and must soon, soon surely fail. So, it, there was so much there and there was so much uh, uh, colonization happening that it was being to, to destroy the crops of the tribes. And he was he was documenting this. But today, um, I, I, I went again back to the maps and showed the old GLO map on the right hand side. Um, in the GLO records, I had to put together and I noticed this giant swale of looks like marshy land that goes down way down south. And if you look at the Google map today, we see the lake itself where it should be and this and down below where where should be that swale. Um, right now, there is actually a, a, a process to restore the lake. Um, a lot of the farmers have just have given up, given up on trying to manage the water in the basins. There's just too much water. And so now they're selling the land back to uh, the National Park Service who, who are putting back put the lake back together, working with the Grand Ronde tribe. So we hopefully we'll see that again. We're actually out there on a regular basis planting more Wapato, so we're hoping to restore Wapato out there. We have to allow water to go back into it first, really. So um, this is kind of one of my slides on this. So there used to be the record, the newspaper records say there was uh, uh, millions of cannabis back ducks there. So much, uh, that, and they fed on this Wapato, there were so many ducks in this basin that uh, weekend warriors, weekend sportsmen from Portland would come down there and they would set up their duck blinds around the lake and they would shoot in shoot ducks in the lake all weekend uh, and would leave the dead ducks in the lake and just leave, go back to Portland. And then the farmers were very upset about this. But that's what they did until the lake was drained in 1935. By that time, the Hayes uh, process of draining the lake, they had created a series of drain fields and it had destroyed the waters to the point where there was no more Wapato and the ducks basically disappeared. So um, so that uh, just replicated basically Lake Labiche. And so 
that was very interesting to me. I wonder how I uh, now wonder how much of that has happened throughout the valley. So I began looking at kind of uh, parks, other places in the valley that may have remnant landscapes, and I and I got to just outside of Salem here is is Minto Brown Park, a very large park. It used to be a big agricultural landscape uh, for fruit trees and nut trees. Um, there's a field called Farm Field in the middle that has lots of of camas growing and as you can see, junk is here. Um, I've I've been visiting that place for about 10 years, uh, traveling on the trails, walking and, and riding the trails. They do uh, um, mow the lake, mow the area, and uh, um, I think they worried about fire there because um, they haven't yet issued a fire plan out there yet. But I noticed a couple of years ago that um, there were these seasonal rains that came in, in you know, May several times and and once the when the main when the rains came these these swales developed in the middle of this field and i was wondering if if that is exactly what we're looking at in terms of the wilkes expeditionary notes and uh, of what the environments of the whole valley were like that they there was areas that would expand into swales uh after seasonal freshets uh, rains would come and so this Literally was in the middle of a camas field, and you see this camas growing around here. Um, and the next, uh, it was gone in a couple of days. All you see is a little puddle here on the, on the trail. So the rest of it is gone. The camas are still here; they're doing still doing fine. So you see one over here. Um, later in the later in the summer, the camas got really high. I found out, you know, by doing these studies of 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 camas growing patterns that. The first camas come up where the or are the common camas, the smaller ones, and then later we see the giant camas erupt, and the, the giant camas erupt well into the midsummer, and they're high enough that they could top. At some place, they top the highest of of the of the of the grasses in the field, so they're very competitive for attention of the bees. As you see, one of these is almost as tall as me, right there in the middle of the field, right there pretty tall and you can see we're in the this is in the season uh probably like june yeah late june when everything's going to seed and we see the the giant camas now finally going to seed um the seeds are still mostly green so they haven't dried up um, but so there's still some plants out there just trying to figure out again what the camas season was like um, and then in July, they've all dried up and they turn to seed and they, ha they have a really nice kind of ringing bell uh, sound. So only about half the summer is a camas season. The rest of the summer is other stuff. They have there's uh, onions and there's garlic and there's other food plants, uh, biscuit root, other things growing in these fields. They could collect other times of the summer. Uh, tar weeds at the end of the summer that would be collected after they burnt the fields things like that so this this may be being thinking about you know uh you know maybe the calapuya seasons were not based on our seasons you know the spring summer fall winter and but instead their seasons were based on what plants were available when and so they have a plant seasonal cycle so they have there's a camas season and there's tarweed season and there's you know wapato season. So that those would be the basic ones. There may be other seasons in the mean in the meantime, but but but, but like acorn season and stuff like that. But that's seems a uh, a very interesting proposal in terms of how they imagine their seasons instead of how we we imagine their seasons. So, and I noticed, and I started doing more research on the GLO maps, and I found there's lots of camas swales all around the, the prairies, uh, all throughout the valley. Here's one labeled as a wet camas prairie out by Rickeryall. Um, very interesting area. There's Basket Slough right here, Rickeryall over here. And then uh, out by Woodburn, there's tons of, you look at the GLO maps, there's tons of these marshes and stuff all over the place. Isn't I mean this is like the Bish, so there's another one out this way, and there's another one over here. Uh, and then if you look over by uh, the Twalton Valley up up on the far uh, western side, 
all these areas are labeled on the maps as being very sort of wet, wet prairie or swamp, swamp. And I've just re uh, superimposed uh, those those names on these maps. So, so we're not talking a minor part of the environment of the valley. We're talking a pretty major uh, environmental type for the valley. Um, these these seasonal swales or swamps, marshes were a major part of the valley. Here's another one, all the way down south uh, south of Eugene, Camas Swale, right there. See that? It's huge. I mean, I don't know how big it is, but it's probably in contains some of this stuff over here and over here. It's just gigantic down, you know, south of Eugene here. And, and I have some quotes from my research this summer. The side of Eugene was at that time was very, very wet. Several sloughs across the area, and it was sort of marshland. So that's actually the description of downtown Eugene today. Um, they've changed it quite a bit. Um, so if we are working on restoration and we're thinking about um, returning fire to land, we have to think about what is the settler colonial heritage of this place? Uh, what did they do? What did settlers do to change it to sort of fit their model of what is worthful, uh, uh, valuable land? And how did they get rid of worthless stuff? And what they, how they label, why they label stuff worthless? Um, so I, work with lots of folks that want to restore landscapes to decolonize things. Uh, but we need to understand, uh, from my perspective, what the history of that place was. I mean, to just impose your own view on the landscape seems like it's going to be um, creating something new, uh, a new sort of alien landscape, not something that exists before. So we need to think about how we can recreate the landscape like it was before, the way Native people had created it in the past, and also how that may be changed somewhat by climate change. So we need to really kind of worry about uh, a lot of different things, not just fire, but we need to bring water into the picture as well. So this will increase, uh, these changes would increase agricultural wealth for settler families. Uh, so th that's what they did. They, they, they increased settler wealth for settlers of the families while de devaluing, destroying traditional native landscapes, everywhere in the West. Water needs to be restored, uh, returned, allowed to remain in conjunction with efforts to restore cultural fire. And then uh, at some level, removal of dams, restoring fire is only beginnings of restoration. So a lot of folks are really focused on right now, the removal of dams in the Columbia. But uh, part of that has to be also a discussion about also restoring environments of the upper, upper of the tributaries to the Columbia, because that's where the fish are actually spawning. Fish are rarely spawning in the Columbia itself. They just travel in the Columbia. They're actually spawning in the in the Willamette and the Deschutes and other rivers that are tributaries to the Columbia that we're, we actually need to spend a lot of time and effort because that's where we're going to create healthy populations of fish. Um, and thank you. That's my that's that part of the presentation. I, I wanted to briefly go over my book. So um, people have already mentioned my book, The Travel History of the Long Valley. It's gotten a lot of, I guess, positive press. Um, uh, it's sold out. Um, uh, I think people are are appreciative of of the book and its uh, its its histories. I really wanted um, uh, to address a lot of problems we have in scholarship and history today. And you know, when I was growing up in Oregon, I did never learned about the tribal histories of Oregon. And even into my into college, there wasn't a lot available. There was a few books here and there. But I really had to, to piece everything together from articles and things that I was learning from from what we call primary sources. And so um, over the last 25 years or so, I put together my own histories, uh, collecting resources for that. And and I learned that there's a lot of stories in the sort of colonization era uh, when the tribes are being having to change their lifestyle to fit um, a settler lifestyle, sort of being forced to do so by settlers. Uh, a lot of stories in there about how, you know, they were not respected, their, their values are not respected, their land claims are not respected. And uh, and because of that, they were forced to sort of take treaties and move to reservations and not really given much thought when they were moved to a reservation. Um, they, in fact, were, were sometimes ignored to the point where people just died 
never having gotten the uh, promises made by Indian agents and and the the U.S. government uh, through treaties. And these treaties, you know, are considered the parts of the uh, the laws of the United States. They become law. And and for the federal government and Americans to not to not respect the tribes who literally gave away all their land, millions and millions of acres of land in exchange for a safe place to live seems really odd. And, and for, and, and for that to be my part of my heritage to understand that, that, that I'm living through the end results of that uh, was pretty astounding to me. Um, and I, I became to realize that, you know, the reason why my family and, all my relatives at the reservation have lived so poorly for so long is because we were not allowed to, to have anything by settlers. Our land was taken away. All of our resources were taken away. We were forced to on, onto reservations where every few generations more was taken away from us. Uh, once we got a little piece of land given an allotment, in fact, that was actually taken away from us in termination. So, um, so nothing has really benefited us. Everything has always benefited the settler cultures, the federal government and settler cultures. So that's kind of the story. Um, it's kind of what we what we say is the other side of the story. There are plenty of books out there that have non-native stories, white stories of, of settlement and the Oregon Trail. And I didn't want to rewrite that again. I wanted to write the native story. You know, what is what did we go through? What did our people go through? What are we still going through because of that that history? And so, so that's my book. Um, I um, there are lots of history in there. There are stories from the local areas in there. There's also some personal writings of my own about me encountering these stories for the first time, what it meant to me, what it may mean to people of the tribe. And so, I hope that's exciting. I, I hope it's used in high schools. I hope people want to hear the whole story because. If you don't want to hear the native side, if that's not uh, interesting to you, then you're only going to be seeing maybe a quarter of what we consider history uh, of the whole region, because most uh, non-native histories don't include uh, women's perspectives. They don't include the perspectives of blacks or Latinos or Asians or or native peoples. Uh, the majority of histories are written without our 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 viewpoints respected um, and don't really follow us into the reservations at all. And I try that. I try to follow us into the reservation and show what happened to us on the reservation too. So um, so hopefully you 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 uh, read it and understand what I'm trying to get to on this. Uh, there probably will be other projects off this. Um, I'm sure there will be. Um, but that's but I've been writing many of these histories on my blog site for years now. And uh, some of my essays in the blog um, actually were the blueprints for some of the chapters in here. And so um, if you want to read further beyond the book, you can actually go to the blog and, and call the Cortex Journal and get more. There's a lot. There's over 500 essays on, on the Cortex Journal, so you can actually get quite a bit of history. You can be reading it for days if you want. So um, I'm just saying that. And uh, so that's all I'm going to say for now. I guess I'll turn it over for questions. and. Uh, Hopefully we can um, come to some some understanding here. So, okay, thank you so much. That was super interesting. I I really uh, appreciated everything, especially the point of um, you know as we're working to restore lands, what are we restoring those lands back to? What histories are we referencing when doing that? So, thank you so much. Um, okay, so there are some questions. I want to go back to one that was that's interesting. And um, uh, one person asked if you came across any evidence of reed canary grass being present in the valley prior to settlement. Um, I didn't look for it, and I hear it's a invasive. So no. Yeah, and then people were mentioning there's some debate about whether or not it was present, and. Um, I will leave it to the the plant people to debate that to continue. <laughs> um, all right, let me go back up to. You know, I'm pretty much um, concerned about food plants of the tribes. Um, those are the the big stars in my presentation. 
I wasn't looking for all the grasses and stuff. Most of them are, don't have any value to the tribes at all unless they have grains. Uh, a few grasses, uh, maybe like like sedges, like the uh, uh, juncus is used for basketry, so that I follow that a little bit too. Um, Mary asks, what do you think of land acknowledgements? Um, I don't think they really do much. Um, I think that that uh, a better... I mean, it's fine as an introduction, but I think they all should say and do more research. And, you know, if you really want to respect Native peoples, you know, uh, um, just like we have had to, uh, or for, sometimes forced to through school or, or or social systems or whatever to, to understand and, and read about cultures that um, are outside of Native culture that are, you know, part of ours, but outside of Native culture. I think that other people should take the responsibility of, of reading and learning more about native cultures um, on their own. Um, and and uh, I think that's a respectful way to go rather than um, just going with a statement that um, doesn't really do much to help anybody. And Lisa asks um, that, will there be more um, books published if the first rounds sold out? Yeah, they're they're um, supposedly um, getting more um, into the warehouse this week or next week, something like that. Um, I'm, I'm apparently I'm able to order some for next week. I'm going to pick them up at the at Uligan Press at PSU. Um, you can order there yourself. I mean, that Uligan Press has a website. You can go there and uh, order books if you want, and pick them up there. I think at the press office um, if you want. Um, Otherwise, it'll probably be about uh, three weeks to three weeks to a month before they get back in the bookstores again. Uh, Willow would like you to talk about the process of um, establishing the tribal museum. Um, well, that was you know it's been it was being worked on when I I got to the tribe as as the director of culture, um, and I you know I come in um, in the midst of doing my PhD and got my PhD, but I already had been doing studies on on tribal museums i'd gone to tomaskalik and i'd gone to other tribal museums around the nation you know uh and and seeing how they did things learned some things from them and then uh but we still didn't have the money at grand run so when the when the old uh middle school grade school became available at grand Ronde, um um and they and they were clearly were going to buy it as a piece of property and they wanted to know what to use for it. I, I just wrote one note into my, my report, you know, use it for a museum. So, um, and they did that. So that's what we got. We got the, the school and we just had to modify the interior of the school to become uh, more of a museum uh, interior. And I, I actually planned that whole thing out in the, and the uh, architects followed my plan tribe followed my plan even though i wasn't at the tribe after uh, 2014 um and so uh we we developed a uh, professional style of uh of archives and professional you know hvac systems so you can actually we can actually receive smithsonian type collections out there like any other big museum um so and that's what that was the intent because we were looking at collections in in Great Britain, uh, the Summers Collection, um, and we're looking at other collections that I needed to be able, we needed to be able to receive those collections with some security um, and a surety that, that we're not going to destroy the collections when they got, once they got to Grand Ron. So it needed to be the highest standards that we did that. So, um, so that's, um, yeah, very successful. Um, made sure everybody was trained, made sure we had good policies in place, and then after uh we opened half the museum i moved on but um they did the rest themselves so great um marita hopefully i'm pronouncing that correctly wants you to speak about the impact of the destruction of um the beaver population in the valley and what that had on the land um it had to be i mean they were probably one of the the major uh resources that would have created these lakes in the first place so some of the lakes were created because of them because of their, their activities um so they are likely uh going to be a major part of the restoration too uh, returning be more beavers back to the valley would be 
beneficial to helping create these 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 lake systems. So um I think that we're gonna have to, I mean, I, I know the the agricultural lobbies are really strong in the state because you know uh the Lot Valley is huge on, on agriculture. You can't go anywhere without seeing ag fields. I don't think we're ever gonna like destroy that in, in the valley, but I think we could turn some of the river systems into uh back into native landscapes like especially those that have not been dammed, like uh, maybe the the uh, Lucky Mute system, it's not really well dammed. And so we could probably turn that whole system back into a native landscape if we really wanted to focus on that system by itself. So returning uh, uh, beavers there, um, allowing uh, swales to, to appear again, destroying grain fields would be great. Yeah, I always find it funny uh, getting out and there'll be like signs like we love beavers and then there's like fences <laughs> surrounding all the trees <laughs> it's like right, right, right. <laughs> um nick wants to know uh your thoughts on maybe the best way for the federal government to be involved in restoration um well they've done they've not done a great job so far um uh, i think offering money for research I don't know if people have, I mean, I'm offering kind of a unique thing, doing historical research on what happened, trying to, what I call reconstruct what happened, uh, the sort of colonial events. Um, and I don't, don't know if a lot of other folks have done that. Um, I think that folks are just trying to say, okay, we're starting with this and we're just going to move forward from this. But I think that we really need to understand more about what this place was before, before we really can move forward. Um you know, because, you know, I've worked with a lot of like, you know, oak savanna type restorations. And uh, a lot of times they'll bring me in to say, hey, look how, look what we did here. Look how great the oak savanna is. I'm like, well, that's great. What are you going to do with it? Because Native people didn't create a, a picturesque landscape to walk through. They created a food place. So are you going to eat the, eat the, 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 you know, the acorns? Are you going to, what about the other plants and animals that depend on the oaks? What about that? Um, um, do do you care about that? Or are you just going to create a park where you, where you mow everything down all the time? Or I mean, so that so a lot of thought needs to go into the reasons why Native people had an oak savanna in the first place and the other plants and animals and birds and everything else that depended on that landscape as well. And if you really want to restore something, restore that. Restore that landscape, not just the oak savanna. Um, Holly was wanting some clarity about <clears throat> the nature of the lakes that you were talking about. Um, it seems like maybe she's confused about whether it was like a kind of um, seasonal lake that was wet during the summer, or were you mainly talking about um, wintertime wetlands? Well, some of them were were, uh, were annual. I mean, they're all they're there all the time. Like Lake Labish was an was a was a ever present lake. In the in the midsummer, it may be very shallow because uh, there's been less rain, um, but it was always water there. So the thing is, um, if you've lived in Oregon for a while, you know that it rains a lot. Like when I was growing up in Oregon in the 1970s and 80s, it rained. I I would always say it could rain every day, and nowadays it doesn't do as so much, but 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 think about that. And so if it rains every day, where does the water go? I mean, it's going to be if we if we allow it to be trapped in 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 the lakes and let them expand and contract like they normally would, uh, like an organism, um, then then that's what we need to do again. Um, so we're not just talking about like part of the problem is all of us are too young to know what has happened to the, this whole system of, of lakes in the valley to the water systems of the valley i mean much of it was destroyed before we were born so uh so and nothing has been done i have very seen i've seen maybe two articles on this this whole issue since i've been doing research on this uh so there's not been a lot of research out there there's no books on there out there there's no histories of this so we're doing new stuff here. We're looking at new things, new new ways of, per, of perceiving things. And, and part of that perception is understanding, like I said, that in the summer, we would have these lakes that would expand to 80 feet long or whatever it is, half mile long and 
80 feet wide and a foot deep um, in the middle of the valley. And that was just normal. And it was everywhere. It was not just in one spot. It was everywhere in the valley. So um, that's normal. We're not, uh, so that's year round that they could happen. It wouldn't rain for a week and then the, the water would go away. They would rain again. So these seasonal freshets would happen all the time. Uh, there would absolutely be winter rains too, but uh, that's what we're talking about. I mean, we just don't, uh, it's kind of hard to think beyond our own mindset of where, what we think about the valley as being, you know, dry in the summertime and wet in the wintertime. That's not at all what my understanding of Oregon was when I was growing up. I remember it raining in the summertime all the time. Now it doesn't do so much, as much. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I Greg Archuleta told me one time to the, uh, about all the natural springs that would have been in the valley. Yeah, and that's really interesting as well. That just so much more water than maybe we imagine. Um, Anna is asking how much of this research has been mapped. Well, I've only done Lake Labish and, and uh, Lake Wapato, Wapato Lake. Um, uh, and I haven't really done like a comprehensive job across the valley. Uh, I haven't had the money or time to do that yet. I've had a book to launch. So um, I've been trying to, I mean, I think that's going to be the next big book I do. It's going to be on environment of of the Calipuyans of the valley. Um, I'd like to do more with that. It seems like a really interesting topic. Um, I just did some research this summer in the Eugene area and found a lot about the Eugene area, including that the whole of Eugene downtown was a big wetland. Uh, and I found lots of statements about you know how wet everything was. So um, I think that that would be a really great topic to do. Um, so yeah, I'm just I don't have a full great answer for that. Yeah. Um, what landscape are we seeing behind you? On your Zoom background, uh, I, th- I think it's over at Mount um, Mount Pisgah. There's an area where um, you can see kind of Eugene or Springfield in the background, but you, there's an area you can almost see no no habitation. So, um, Calvin wants to know: Have you done any research on native landscapes on the Washington side? No. Okay. Um. Valerie was wondering about air quality concerns with um, bringing burning back. I don't know if that's something that you want to answer, but um, she asks, how will you work with people and their concerns with air quality? Well, I think that um, I think the the issue is, uh, you know, there are laws that people are concerned about air quality and stuff. Um, If you have cultural fires, like it's set every year or every couple of years two or three years um in in the, the landscapes then you have less uh actual burning overall than than when you then when you wait 15 20 30 years to have a have a catastrophic fire so there's less uh particulates in the air at that point um and uh it doesn't burn as deeply it just burns off the top layer because there's no fuel um the, the problem with catastrophic fires is they burn very deeply. They burn everything down to the, 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 the forest floor or the bottom of the prairie floor. They burn the trees. So you have more particulates in the actual fire um, smoke than you would if you have what they call a cool burn or a cultural burn in the valley. Um, so that's, that's the trade-off. There are probably some concerns um but it, what we using technology nowadays we can control it better uh to the point where we don't have to worry as much um about um, it getting out of control especially in the valley um someone wants you to explain where the kalapuya were on your map and was wondering if that if they lived as far north as portland um let's see i'll share a screen again So these are all Calapuya. Um, let's see. There's that little sliver right there is Portland. And there's the Twalton on the other side of the Twalton Hills. Mm-hmm. So they're technically within parts of 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 West Portland. 
in the Portland metro area. Were, uh, were you related to the Multnomah tribe? Uh, no, I'm related to the the Saniam, mm -hmm. the Elmas from down here, and the Chinooks up here. But up was here. the Multnomah tribe on Sully Island uh, a Kalapuya? No, they were Chinookan. Chinook, they were Chinook, yeah. So we have Clackamas here, and so the 12th and right here. And there was absolutely relatives uh, back and forth. So there was people uh, from the 12th and, you know, married in with all the tribes too. So, but... Mm -hmm. Most of the Portland Metro was not Twalton. It was, it was, it was what's called Chinookan instead. Um, another question from Jenny with the change in climate. Have you thought about the use of treated wastewater, recycled water to bring back some of the hydrology to these landscapes? I haven't. Um, there were several questions about the beaver soils. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it seemed like those were kind of answered, but um, I can ask you, um, when you referenced like Lake Labish, the, the dark peat soils, um, some people were just wondering why they were called beaver soils. Um, that's what they were called in the literature. Um, I think nowadays they're called peat soils. Uh, they're called rich peat soils. Uh, I, th I think it's because they're beaver soils because there were beavers were creating helping create them there's quite a bit of beavers and uh, i mean i don't know if we understand how many animals were in this system i mean the newspaper reports for lake labish were that there were thousands of animals there there were you know uh bears and panthers and deer and beavers and other things there lots of stuff at lake labish mm. um natalie wants to know um if there's a, a number or a year on how far back people may have inhabited the Willamette Valley? Um, well, I think um, archaeologically, the dates go back 9,500 years. Um, we do, though, have uh, oral histories of uh, what appears to be um, Missoula floods. There's two um, oral histories of, of people going through these massive flood cycles that, that cover the whole valley in water which appears to be a musical flood um, story that both of them do. And so that suggests perhaps 16,000 years. Um, and I would guess if they go back further than that, the problem is we don't have all those flood soils have covered uh, all the cultural sites of the Valley up, up to a depth of some places, hundred feet. So there's no archeology, span archeology span happening uh, below the, the flood soils right now, the, the Missoula flood soils because it's too expensive, they don't know where to dig, and you know nobody's gonna do that kind of exploration right now. Um, do we wanna, there's a couple more questions. Do we want to keep going or should we? Go ahead, yeah. Okay. Uh, Lori wants to know what impacts will invasive plants and animals have on the scope of restoration efforts? Um, makes it hugely expensive. Um, time consuming. Um, I think that with burning, uh, you could impact a lot of those invasives because part of the problem is we've taken away burning. Um, so we don't know exactly how all the invasives are going to respond if you burn every uh, two to three years. I think that it would um, suppress many of, the, many of the invasive plants because the native plants were somewhat adapted to a burn cycle of two to three years. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my, that's my theory and I, we need to test it, but um, I've seen like, if you look at some of the buttes that have burned recently, and I, I looked at some buttes uh, like ward butte and stuff that burned a couple of years ago, um, it did suppress the blackberries pretty good. Thing is they didn't really reburn. If they'd reburned it three years later, we could see then uh, see how much they suppress blackberries more. I think that would be a huge effect though. Um, Amanda asks, what's the biggest challenge to doing your research? Um, finding time, <laughs> you know, um, I'm, you know, tenure track. So they demand, have a lot of demands on me to do a lot of different things that takes away from all my research time and writing time. So, um, it's just, you know, finding time. If I, if, 
if somebody gave me a couple million dollars, I could probably do my research right now and not have to worry about tenure track anything. So, but that's not happening. We'll create a GoFundMe for you. <laughs> um, any suggestions on how we adapt our restoration to climate change? Um, yeah, that has to be taken into account. I mean, all the tribes are working on this stuff on climate change. They're working on doing things like moving huckleberries into the interior of the mountains so that, to save the the crops and the stuff because we're looking at um, you know a pretty a rapid change to almost a Mediterranean climate in this area pretty soon. I mean, that's why all the 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 grape uh, orchards are moving up to Oregon because they. They can't survive in, in the, the the Napa area, Sonoma County anymore. They have to move north, where there's more water and there's um, and the water temperature is getting higher. So, um, but I, I mean, I don't. I mean, that has to be taken into account. Um, I think that we're going to have to use technology to somewhat mitigate um, uh, to so, a, as a, a mitigation of of some of these na these native processes too. It looks like this might be the last question, but um, in the cultural fires, were all were all things burned? Were all the plants burned? No, I mean the, the description, and I probably should do it more with um, the Wilson exhibition notes. Their description was that the fire would burn right up to the thickets. So we're talking about like these these probably like uh, willow oak thickets hazel thickets that were next to the rivers um so they were they were damp enough inside these thickets it would stop the stop the fire and then if there was at the same time swales in the valley a lot of water in the valley it would have stopped from burning anything uh it would have like slowed down or stopped the fire you know where it's where it's really damp so um i think that no i, I mean that's that's the thing with having a uh, regular fire you set two every two to three years um in a, in a prairie uh it only burns like the last couple of years of of uh um, fuels um it doesn't you don't have a buildup of 10 15 20 30 sometimes 30 or 40 years of, of fuels for it to burn very deeply very long and destroy everything uh, in that environment where it burns really deeply it destroys the bulbs, it destroys the seeds, it destroys everything. So, so that's not what you want. So if you, if you let it burn, you plan it to burn, uh, like when the rains start to come in the fall, then you have your water helps you out quite a bit. A um, couple more questions came in. <laughs> uh, Cammie wants to know if we should embrace some of the non-native plants on the landscape. Um, I don't think we have a choice. I mean, I don't think they're, re they're really going to go away. It's it's really super difficult to get rid of blackberries and really super difficult to get rid of a lot of grasses if you can even identify them. I mean, that's that that's a special skill to be able to identify different grasses. So I can't do it. Um, so I don't think we're going to ever get totally rid of invasive plants. Yeah, you might check out Cami um, Emma Maris. She actually is based in Portland now. She has a book called Wild Souls and kind of has some interesting philosophy on how to yeah live with invasives, both plants and animals. Um, Elise asks, you mentioned the burning effects of Himalayan blackberry. Do you know if it affects Canadian thistle? Yeah, I mean, uh, you mean like the thistle comes from, from Europe? Um, it says Canadian, so... I, I, I know the European thistles were brought here um, to... to uh, I don't know about Canadian th thistles. I don't know. Um, it, thistle, I think one of, some of the thistles were actually native, so if the Canadians are close enough, it's not going to be a problem. Um, I don't know. Are you talking about teasel, Elise? Because that's definitely yeah. The teasel is a big problem. Um, you know, like if you go to if you go to Minto Brown, there's a huge field of it in some areas. Um, it, it was brought here to to help card the wool in in the um, in the the plants that the industry. Um, 
and then it got it got loose. So it's everywhere now. Um, it does need to be burned off. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad in some places. Um. Okay. Uh, this might be a little broad, but can you explain more about TEK? Sociological knowledge. I mean, it suggests that um, that Native people already had a, a knowledge of their landscape. Um, that it's not just a passive knowledge that they just kind of, oh yeah, let's do this. They actually knew when and what to do with their landscape, when to burn, when to harvest, when to go hunting, when to go fishing. Uh, they knew how they knew the they could read the signs of the land, like uh, it, with the flower comes up over here, then they know the fish are spawning over there. So they they knew that certain things happen at certain times. Um, they knew the, the life cycle of the camas. They planned it like on the calendar. They said before, like in the early spring, before the camas erupts into uh, flower, then you can you can uh, dig camas and eat it, process and eat it. Then you let it go to flower and go to seed. Then you can eat it again. You can process and eat it again. So, so they they already knew these things. Just like um, you and I uh, that grew up in this culture, we know when apples are ripe. We know when blackberries are ripe. We know when strawberries are ripe they knew when their plants are ripe so and animals and, and fishes and everything else mm -hmm. another question do you know much about the historic use of hazelnut twigs for basketry i do know something i'm not um a weaver with hazel uh but i i, I have heard a lot of things um yeah the native hazels were actually harvested by some tribes and processed um i think it really took off at the reservation period because those hazels uh were a lot more sturdy than the junkus was that the californians normally would use and so the hazels were really uh wanted for baskets that they could sell to uh, non-native people you know in in neighboring towns around the reservation and so they made a lot of baskets from that in, in the reservation period because of that Uh, looks like this might be the last one. Um, so this, I like this question. Maybe we can end on it. Besides your book, <laughs> can you recommend some things uh, you consider essential reading for this audience? Um, I mean, there are other books like, you know, um, Patricia uh, Warat Phillips has her Ethnobotany of the of Kus Lorompa Sayusla people. I mean, that was, I think, published a little more than 10 years ago. It's a pretty good book. Um, uh, Doug Dewar just put out a pretty good book on uh, what's called Ethnobotany of the something, of a tribe. I think it's the Quin Quinault. Is it yeah. Quinault? Yeah. I haven't read it. I have it. I haven't read it yet. Um, it looks pretty good. He's usually a pretty good writer. Uh, he seems to know what he's doing. So, um, so there are other sources out there i'd look for like native sources so that you could actually maybe um get a different perspective because if you're constantly reading non-native books you're not getting native perspective at all because most most time non-native writers don't don't add native perspective into their stuff so yeah great are we good i think so yeah um i'll turn it over to you willow Thank you so much for answering all those questions. Thank you. Thanks for your audience. Thank you very much, Dr. Lewis.